In the pale moonlight above the Dead Sea, the silence of Qumran is eternal. The limestone cliffs stand like rows of ancient witnesses, their shadows long across the desert floor, jagged silhouettes etched against a sky pricked with indifferent stars. It is 1947, and the world is awakening after war, unaware that history's deepest secret lies just below the sands, buried not in gold or marble, but in the fragile hush of forgotten words. A Bedouin shepherd scanning the ravine for a lost goat kicks a pebble into a yawning cave. The stone clatters, echoing like a summons from the depths. The shepherd and his brother stare down the darkness, hearts quickening in the chill night air. In the flickering torchlight, shards of pottery glint like scattered teeth, and inside one fragile jar, they unearth brittle parchments, scrolls whose faded ink has not seen the sun in nearly 2,000 years. The boys unroll the first scroll with trembling hands, the dry parchment crackling like autumn leaves underfoot. Hebrew letters swirl like ghosts on the skin, poetry and prophecy breathe again, their ancient cadence rising unbidden from the dust, as if the very air of the cave conspires to revive the voices long silenced by time and tide. Word rushes out from the cave like a desert wind, carrying whispers of wonder and urgency across the parched landscape. Scholars flood in, archaeologists with trowels and sieves, linguists armed with lexicons, paleographers peering through magnifying lenses, all drawn by the miracle of this find, their footsteps crunching over sun-bleached gravel that hides untold secrets. By torch and lantern, they wash each fragment in shallow basins of spring water, painstakingly fit them together like cosmic puzzles, edges aligning with the precision of fate. In a makeshift tent, its canvas walls fluttering in the hot Sirocco, an aged scribe traces a finger over a line of text. His eyes widen in astonishment. This is the book of Isaiah, preserved verbatim, yet a millennium older than his oldest copy, its verses flowing with the same rhythmic fire that once thundered from synagogue pulpits. He whispers psalms he knows by heart, hearing them echoed in this tomb's quiet, the words bridging centuries in a single breath. Visions of suffering. Servants and desert blooms that feel as fresh as the morning dew on Jordan's banks. As more jars are opened in the weeks ahead, almost every book of the Hebrew scriptures emerges in pieces, the Torah's laws etched with unyielding clarity, the prophet's laments roar with exile's ache, psalms swelling with songs of ascent and despair. Other finds thrill, the investigators, the copper scroll etched on unyielding bronze, lists buried temple treasures. A cryptic treasure map promising hordes of gold and silver hidden in the shadows of Jerusalem's fall. The war scroll prophesies a final battle of the sons of light against the sons of darkness, its apocalyptic fervor blown from the past into the present like a clarion call across the ages. Hymns of gratitude, rules of a covenant, commentaries on prophecy. These scrolls are neither simple relics nor idle fragments. They are living words, pulsating with the faith of those who penned them, each line a testament to a community's unyielding devotion amid persecution and isolation. The lid of the cave swings shut behind the archaeologists, but inside, a living room of scholars, the past has come to life. Ultraviolet lamps reveal ink no eye could see, staggering syntax etched in Aramaic, Greek, even unknown scripts that hint at lost dialects of devotion. Each night back in Jerusalem, Academics gather in candlelit archives, the air thick with the scent of aged leather and strong tea, their voices a polyphony of awe and debate. They quote lines to each other in Hebrew and Greek, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted, the words hanging like incense smoke, evoking the communal meals where such beatitudes might have been shared. A verse from a hidden psalm resurrects in a century-old newspaper print, its melody rediscovered after centuries of dormancy. Every fragment teaches that scripture was once a vibrant, breathing thing, copied by human hands who loved and feared their God, their quills dipping into ink mixed from gallnuts and iron salts under the flicker of oil lamps. Some letters differ by a stroke or two, subtle flourishes that spark endless discussion, a yod elongated here, a valve curved there, and every variance is studied as though a divine footnote, a whisper of how sacred texts evolved through the faithful's careful stewardship. A scholar rubs his temple, realizing that each tiny variation is proof of the long road these words have traveled. Proof that God's whisper must pass through men before reaching our ears, shaped by the very humanity it seeks to redeem. By the first light of dawn, the scene shifts. The desert wind still sighs through Qumran's ruins, carrying the faint briny tang of the Dead Sea salt flats. But now we step into the past, 
where the air hums with the quiet intensity of purpose. In the half light of morning, a costa of adobe structures hum with life. Men with linen robes and wild hair, their beards unkempt from ascetic vows. Emerging from the ritual baths at the river's edge, faces alight with purpose as water droplets glisten like jewels on their skin. They immerse themselves in the mikvehs carved from the rocky shore. The cold Jordan waters a baptism of renewal, cleansing not just body but soul from the world's impurities. Among them, scribes clutch leather-bound scrolls, their fingers calloused from endless transcription, gathering under a low pavilion woven from date palms for communal worship, chanting hymns that shimmer with otherworldly fire, voices rising in harmonious waves that blend with the distant bleat of goats and the rustle of tamarisk leaves. Their master scroll is passed hand to hand, the community rule, and a robe teacher reads aloud, his voice steady as the sun's ascent. His voice is calm, yet urgent. Today's reading recounts a sacred history, weaving tales of covenant and exile that bind them closer than blood. They are the Essenes, or Yahad, the community, the true remnant of Israel, guardians of the covenant, a sect forged in the fires of disillusionment with the temple's corruption. Their lives, a deliberate echo of the prophet's wilderness wanderings. Inside the scriptorium, a dim chamber walled with whitewashed plaster and lit by slits of sunlight, another priest tradesman dips a quill in black ink, the feathers tip scratching softly against fresh parchment as he copies the latest words of Isaiah, his breath measured to avoid smudging the delicate surface. Outside, a dark banner of clouds creeps across the sky, casting fleeting shadows over the communal tables where bread is broken and shared, each loaf blessed with a prayer that invokes the manner of old. A child plays by the campfire, listening to elders speak of the teacher of righteousness. A prophet, anointed leader who once walked among them and was betrayed, his teachings a beacon in the gathering storm of Roman shadows. In some scrolls they write, veiled as prophecy, hints of his life. He was taken in the council, yet shall stand again in the lot of the holy. Words that pulse with unresolved longing, as if the ink itself yearns for vindication. They do not name him, but their grief is open as a wound, etched into every careful line, a collective ache that fuels their nocturnal vigils. Younger men murmur of the man of lies in Jerusalem, the high priest's agent who drove them into exile, his treachery, a betrayal of the sacred fire. We are fallen like Abraham, one whispers, but God will raise us like Isaac, invoking the patriarch's trials as a mirror for their own, their voices low against the crackle of thornbrush flames. Overhead, a golden eagle wheels, an omen of destiny, its cry piercing the vast blue like a herald from the divine council. These desert sectarians hoard their own version of the law, interpreting it through lenses of purity and preparation, their days governed by a strict calendar of solar seasons that defies the lunar rhythms of the temple elite. Each meal is sanctified with blessings unknown to ordinary Jews, simple fare of barley flatbread, lentils simmered with wild herbs, and dates sweetened by the sun eaten in silence to honor the inner light. They chant psalms after every sacrifice of bread. May my voice rise like incense before you. Their harmonies weaving through the wadi-like threads of gold. The scribes compile their own hymns, Pesherim, that interpret visions from Habakkuk and Zechariah as prophecy for the community, decoding stars and stones as signs of the imminent end. To them, the year 70 of Rome's count is on the horizon, a final purge foretold in their midnight councils, where oil lamps flicker like watchful eyes. They anticipate two anointed leaders, one Aaronic priest to lead in the sanctuary, restoring the altars defiled by commerce, and one Israelite king to shepherd the people, his scepter, a symbol of just rule amid chaos. They believe candles will be lit side by side in Jerusalem and Qumran when God's promise is fulfilled, twin flames uniting the scattered flock. In silence we hear their prayers, O God of Israel, let the oppressor be crushed, their voices a furious yet hopeful torrent, rising from throats parched by ascetic discipline. Day after day, in caves that echo with dust and devotion, they quote scripture, He lifted me out of the pit, he will set my feet on a rock, the words a lifeline in their voluntary exile. They add new verses to it too, stirring hymns of deliverance like, On the day of my affliction I will confess thee, written in their own hand, blending ancient prophecy with fresh revelation born of trial. Here, we glimpse how the scrolls mirror and diverge from the Bible. Every prophecy is a lantern passed down through generations of faithful hands. And every deviation, a phrase amplified for emphasis, 
a ritual clarified for communal practice, arises because they too heard God, just as Moses did on Sinai's thunderous heights. Their interpretations are living dialogue with the Eternal. The scene shifts again. Dust swirls in a modern lab. Test tubes fizz with chemical preservatives. Carbon dating machines hum like distant thunder. The scribes of today are scientists armed with microscopes and spectrometers. Their white coats a stark contrast to the linen robes of old, piecing fragments with tweezers as delicate as a surgeon's scalpel. On this table lie Isaiah's soaring visions, Enoch's ethereal journeys through celestial realms, Jubilee's retelling of creation's dawn, and the five books of Moses, all in their own voices and languages, a multilingual chorus spanning Hebrew's lyrical flow to Aramaic's terse wisdom. To us they reflect a world on the cusp of Christendom, a Jewish landscape electric with messianic fervor, where every dawn prayer anticipates redemption. Those who follow the Nazarene will read these parchments as if glimpsing Jesus' prelude, the scroll's emphasis on a suffering, righteous one echoing the trials of a Galilean teacher, though no direct mention graces their lines. There is no whisper of a cross or empty tomb. Instead, the scrolls remind them that the Jewish world before that pivotal figure was as charged with expectation as the later accounts describe. A tinderbox of hope, where rivers ran with baptizers' calls and hills, echoed with prophetic cries. They will see John the Baptist's zeal mirrored in a seen lives of penance and purity, desert immersions that prefigure Jordan's waters. They will marvel that the suffering servant prophecy of Isaiah was already treasured in Qumran a century before that teacher's ministry, its verses copied with reverent care, as if the community sensed its fulfillment drawing near. But the scrolls say nothing about disciples or resurrection, they speak of something older, the law of Moses kept in a desert ark, a foundation stone for faiths yet to unfold. Jewish eyes, on the other hand, see affirmation in every unrolled line. These scrolls contain their Bible's ancestor, a textual lineage stretching unbroken from Sinai's revelation. Word for word, where it matches the sacred canon, the rabbis breathe relief. The Sinai covenant survived every exile, from Babylonian chains to Roman yokes, its commandments as steadfast as the cliffs that sheltered them. But where it changes, a word added here for clarity, a verse shifted there to emphasize communal ethics. They smile with understanding, yes, tradition was carried by people who copied and sometimes cramped a line under lamplight. Their variations not errors but echoes of oral depth, and yet the meaning remained, a river carving its course through time. One rabbi traces on his phone a yellowed line of Leviticus, its injunctions on purity glowing under digital light. He prays silently that God's justice will endure as surely as these letters have, bridging the chasm between ancient desert scribes and modern synagogues alive with Sabbath songs. For Jews and Christians alike, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a bridge, proof that the Torah of old and the Psalms of David were treasured far beyond the temple's walls, copied in hidden wadis where the wind howled like prophetic voices. The God's whisper in antiquity still reaches our day through the fidelity of the faithful. And how to speak of Islam? A Muslim scholar listens quietly, his fingers absently tracing prayer beads as the parchments unfurl. Ancient accounts taught that scripture was revealed by angels to Moses, the Torah, and to David, the Psalms. And here are those revelations almost physically in hand, tangible links to the prophetic chain that culminates in the final messenger. The scroll shares stories of the same prophets, Moses leading his people through parted seas, David's psalms of kingship and repentance swelling with raw emotion, every line confirming that the older books were indeed from God, though interpreted and preserved by people across epochs. They do not contradict the later revelation, rather they complement the shared heritage of Abrahamic faiths, illuminating the unbroken thread from Ishmael's well to Muhammad's cave. For Islam, these scrolls are not wholly writ in the strict sense but they are signs of the same divine light that guided their own prophet, manifestations of Tawhid's unity across time. The very idea that a book can lie dormant for centuries, preserved by divine care and then be unveiled later resonates with the view of signs emerging when mankind is ready, much like the Quran's gradual descent over 23 years. A verse from the Psalms, praising the Creator's mercy, might evoke the opening of the Fatiha, both calls to the one who hears the suppliant's plea. In interfaith gatherings, these scrolls become a table of dialogue where scholars from all three traditions pour over a shared fragment, finding common ground in the desert's enduring testimony. The wind rises off the Dead Sea, carrying the faint, mineral bite of evaporating brine. 
In the twilight we see silhouettes in the first century, and he's seen baptized as a new believer in the Jordan, the waters churning like a living spirit. While across time, an early follower absorbs this as background to a baptizer's cry in the wilderness. A hundred years later, a seeker from another tradition studies Hebrew fragments by lamplight, hoping to better understand how ancient monotheism was preserved amid empire's rise and fall. The scrolls themselves watch all three with impassive ink, their silence a canvas for endless interpretation, inviting each generation to inscribe its own questions upon the palimpsest of faith. In the end, though many of their secrets are now known, some remain, veiled like the cave's deeper recesses. Caves still guard whispers, not every fragment of the scrolls has been found, their edges crumbling in hidden fissures where bats flutter like forgotten thoughts. The Copper Scrolls' treasures continue to tantalize treasure hunters, yet no gold has emerged from the earth. Its cryptic coordinates, a riddle wrapped in antiquity's shroud. Some texts are still just fragments. A line of Hosea here, evoking Israel's wayward heart. A phrase of Jeremiah there, mourning a city's fall. As if the desert itself has kept the final answer hidden, doling out revelation in measured doses. But perhaps that is fitting. Divine truth often waits under covers until we earn the insight, emerging not in floods but in the patient drip of discovery, much like the slow carving of canyons by persistent streams. As dawn finally breaks over the salt flats, the horizon empty and grand, painting the cliffs in hues of rose and gold, we feel the presence of something watchful, eternal as the unchanging sea. From cave to library to living room, the Dead Sea Scrolls have spoken and still they listen. Their voices a chorus that defies the silence of two millennia. Their brittle parchments remind us that Revelation is an ongoing song, a melody composed across ages, with each note added by hands both ancient and contemporary. Each listener, Jew reciting amid menorah flames, Christian pondering in shadowed cloisters, Muslim reflecting during Ramadan's quiet hours, or seeker wandering philosophy's halls, hears its own echo in the scroll's silence, a personalized psalm amid the universal hymn. And as sunlight gilds the ruins of Qumran, one last secret seems clear. These scrolls do not belong only to the past. Their words, once hidden and silent, still breathe, pulsing with the rhythm of human longing for the divine. They tell us that the search for meaning is unending, a sacred pilgrimage through dust and devotion, and that in every age, we are the chosen ones to unwrap the next scroll, to hold fragile truth in trembling hands. They remind us that history's greatest stories are written not just by the victors, but by every voice brave enough to write its prayer on a scrap of heaven-dusted leather, ensuring that the light of revelation flickers on, undimmed by time's relentless march.